I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I've recently joined the Biohub, well, at the beginning of this year, so it's not that recent now. And I was really excited to have the opportunity to come to talk to this community, which is my community now, <laughs> of people about what's going on um, to let you know about the Biohub and explain what we're about. Because um, as Laurent st stated at the beginning of the meeting, um, we're really interested in uh, developing a new collaborative community-based uh, uh, research that uh, we'd like to initiate across uh, a number of different institutions. So before I go into the details of the work that I'm going to be doing at the Biohub, I thought I would uh, just give a, a, a big picture overview of the Biohub and what the different groups in the ID side are doing, um, and then uh, tell you a little bit more, go into a little bit more detail about my work um, and kind of give you a preview of what other people in the group will be doing. Um, so the Biohub uh, was founded in 2016. It was uh, based from a generous gift of $600 million from Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, there's also been additional funding provided by Reed Hoffman and Michelle Yi. Um, they donated some significant funds towards the organization. Um, and we are an independent nonprofit medical research organization. Um, and what's unique about the Biohub is in the founding of the Biohub, uh, there was a master collaboration agreement that was established between UCSF, UC Berkeley, and Stanford. And this sort of collaboration agreement had never existed before, so that was a, a major achievement. And um, uh, we are, just so you know where we're located, this is our building right here. We're located just across the street from the Benioff Children's Hospital at UCSF. There, it is a physical place and there are labs there. And uh, the idea was to have this uh, uh, located sort of intermediate between Stanford and UC Berkeley. Uh, we currently are building out uh, some satellite space at Stanford, we're calling that Biohub South, and we're in co um, uh, conversations with uh, the facilities people here at UC Berkeley to have, uh, uh, I guess it would be called Biohub East satellite space over here. Now, as I mentioned, the vision for this is, uh, 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 the whole creation of this is to combine the rich technology, engineering, and intellectual resources that exist across UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford to really try to accelerate life sciences innovation and discoveries. And the overall overarching goal of this um, is to basically develop and apply technologies that will enable doctors to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases during our children's lifetime. And in terms of how we're thinking about doing it and how the Biohub is organized, there's sort of um, three basic themes. These are people, platforms, and projects. So in terms of people, I first want to just tell you about the leadership of the Biohub. So the co-presidents of the Biohub are Joe DeRisi and Steve Quick. They're sort of the people who really have spearheaded the whole Biohub project and working with uh, Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg and bringing this idea to fore, as well as the master collaboration agreement. Peter Kim is the director of infectious diseases. And then there's a pe president's advisory group. So these are um, uh, faculty from each of the three universities involved that have been brought in to work with the presidents and evaluate projects and science and ideas. And that consists of Jennifer Doudna, Jonathan Weissman, and Russ Altman. Now, in addition to the leadership, um, some of you may have heard about the Biohub investigators call that came out pretty early on as the Biohub was organized. So that was a call for applications from investigators across the three universities, UC Berkeley, UCSF, and Stanford, to um, apply for funding for five years uh, of between 300K per year or 150K per year. And what I'm showing you here is the pictures of the 47 people that were selected to uh, become Biohub investigators. And these um, are a really great mix of uh, almost about 50% young investigators to established investigators, as well as um, um, uh, almost 50% male, female. The other interesting thing about this is it's a, a very diverse mix of people from biology, math, computer science, engineering. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing group of people. And uh, basically, these investigators will be coming to the Biohub. We have meetings twice a month. Uh, lunch meetings and sort of um, in, in uh, progress talks. And um, so these are sort of part of the people that we envision, not only kind of coming and visiting the Biohub, but also using the facilities of the Biohub. 
And in terms of the people in general, I mean, the Biohub, as I mentioned, there's a master collaboration agreement across the three different institutions. So we're also interested in broadly collaborating and using the, not just the Biohub investigators, but also uh, other individuals and scientists within the, those three institutions to come to the Biohub and collaborate with us. Um, in terms of the platforms, we have five major platforms that we're building there to um, kind of nucleate the research at the Biohub. One of the platforms is engineering. This is hard engineering, like fluidics, electri electrical engineering, um, mechanical engineering, and that group is led by Rafael Gomez Schoberg. Uh, we will also have a ge genome engineering group, which is being led by Andy May. Andy came to us from Caribou, who is formerly the CSO of Caribou um, Sciences, and now he's at the Biohub. He started in February. We have a genomics platform that consists of uh, a lot of uh, capability on the Illumina front, including a NovaSeq, which is one of the few that have been deployed in early phase testing of that. And that's being headed by no Norma Neff, who's um, coming to us from Stanford. She's headed all the sequencing out of the Quake Lab. And then we also have two other platforms that um, are going to be really interesting. Data Sciences, and that's head by Jim Carcanius. Um, and we're, um, that's a small group of sort of computational biologists as well as mathematicians and deep st st statistical uh, analysis folks that will be joining to help us with our um, analysis of all the big data that we're generating. Um, I also want to just say there will be a whole team of software engineers that will also be kind of on site that we'll be working with that are part of CZI. Now CZI is a Chan Zuckerberg initiative and that's their umbrella sort of philanthropic organization. We are separate from them, but we will be working closely with them on a number of the projects. Um, and the last platform is imaging. And right now um, we have an offer out, but I can't tell you yet uh, uh, whether we have a person for that, but I'm hoping that um, they will join us. Um, so we're, we're sort of in the final stages of of nailing down a person for the imaging. And this person will be um, someone who will uh, be able to help the investigators at the Biohub um, uh, sort of identify maybe the best tools for their, their imaging needs, and if the tool isn't available, potentially help to build it. Oops. In terms of the projects, you may have heard about this. We have two major projects that we're working on at the Biohub. The first project is a cell, cell atlas initiative. And the second project is the Infectious Diseases Initiative. And given the group and the amount of time that I have, I'm really going to focus more uh, in more detail on the Infectious Diseases Initiative in a few uh, slides later in the talk. But I will tell you the basic idea of the Cell Atlas Initiative. In terms of how we're organizing this, we're basically, within each of these groups, we're going to have um, four groups. And um, there will be, so there will be four group leaders. I'm a group leader in the Infectious Diseases side. Um, and uh, each of those groups will be uh, consist of small teams of four to five members, and the idea is to have each of those groups uh, represent diverse areas of expertise, and the, so that we'll also be collaborating internally with each other as well as externally uh, with uh, the CZI the CZ Biohub investigators as well as uh, faculty from across the academic spectrum. For the Cell Atlas Initiative, many of you may have heard about this. This is a very broad, ambitious uh, project that's actually part of a larger international basic science effort. And the goal here is to map all the cells in the human body. Um, in terms of what we're thinking about doing at CZ Biohub is basically applying and developing novel approaches to carry out this mapping. One of my colleagues that sits next to me is an expert in single cell sequencing that he'll be using. He, he's going to be playing a major role in this, in this project. Um, we're also, as I mentioned, uh, looking for, as well as identifying uh, experts in imaging, uh, to look at lineage analysis as well as subcellular architecture. And then uh, there's also going to be a suite of analysis tools that will need to be developed to move this project forward. And this is actually one of um, a major initiative that on the CZI, the software engineers will be working on. In terms of the infectious diseases initiative, um, we sort of have free, four kind of main goals that we're going to be focusing on. We would like to be able to apply and develop new technologies that are going to improve and speed our ability to detect, prevent, treat, and respond to infectious diseases. Um, and so I'm going to walk through a few of these different items and the people who are involved in them just to give you a sense of where we're going. So in terms of detect, um, uh, we have uh, uh, investigator Emily Crawford. 
who is leading projects. She's basically our, our resident metagenomics NGS expert. And Emily has been uh, developing some new combinations of CRISPR technology and metagenomic sequencing to allow us to really be able to increase the sensitivity of our ability to detect pathogens that are either known or unknown in any kind of clinical specimen that we may um, encounter. So she's going to be playing a big role in our pathogen discovery, as well as recovery strategies that we'll be doing in the case where we're looking at diseases of unknown cause or outbreaks. Um, Emily is also um, um, launching a whole project related to antimicrobial drug resistance and improving our ability to rapidly understand and detect what kind of drug resistance is present in clinical specimens. Uh, in terms of prevent, um, we have uh, Leslie Gu, uh, who is here today. She's a new group leader. She just started two weeks ago. Um, so if you have any, any talented uh, postdocs or undergraduates who are graduating that um, you could refer to her, I'm sure she'd be excited to hear about that. She's uh, working more on the immunology side and uh, looking at dissection of antibody responses to uh, structurally dynamic viruses. So she's most recently been working on West Nile, dengue, Zika, and chikungunya, um, and she's really interested in sort of characterizing the antibody response and potentially using that information to help inform uh, engineering of uh, antibodies and, and vaccine development. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping maybe another one of these uh, conferences, you'll be hearing more specifically, more, more detailed information from her about what she's found there. And then in terms of the treat side, that's kind of where my group comes in. So I started at the Biohub in January, and I've just uh, sort of hired two really great UC Berkeley alumni people to join my team. Um, Renu Kumar, who is in Britt Glasinger's lab, is going to be joining the team, and a uh, recent undergraduate from Eva Harris's lab, Kalani Ratnasari, is also going to be joining my team, so I'm really excited about that. And what we're planning to do is take viral genomic approaches to tackle not just a one virus, kind of one um, um, mechanism, sort of approach, but to sort of take a, a broader look in, in a phylo phylogenetic approach to understanding viruses. So I'm, what I'm hoping to do, in, at least in some of the early projects, is to speed the development of replicon systems for antiviral screening campaigns. And also, um, by, by being able to develop these replicon systems, um, help to elucidate questions around basic biology, mechanisms of replication, as well as host interactions. Uh, and as a side project, also take that same kind of broader-based approach looking at more target-based uh, activities. So one of the first areas I'm going to focus on is uh, related to the mononegaviralis uh, viruses. So we've actually heard a lot about these today, and in the most recent talk we heard about one of them, that's RSV. So these viruses are um, a whole group of viruses that are similar in that they're non-segmented, negative sense RNA viruses. And they all share the same overall genome organization that's shown here where um, they have a nucleoprotein, a phosphoprotein, matrix, glycoprotein, and a L, um, large, usually 2,000 amino acids, um, multi-enzymatically active protein that's responsible for replication. These viruses are unique and have been challenging to look at because they actually, they're, they're negative sense viruses, so you can't um, simply transfect a RNA and get the kick off the virus system. You actually need to transfect in, they function, the replication unit is an RMP. And so for someone like me who has an origins in the RNA world and RNA splicing, this is a particularly exciting model system to be looking at RMP functions and activity. Um, so the RMP consists of the, of the N protein, the L protein, and the P protein, and uh, the viral RNA. So these are typically packaged as an RMP in the, viral, in the virus particle. And um, members of these families correspond to the viruses, which, as we've heard about, uh, entail, um, consists of Ebola virus and Marburg virus. And then there's other viruses, such as RSV, human metanuma virus, measles, Sendai, Nipah virus, and rabies and VSV. So a number of these viruses we can culture in, in vitro, and it's not that difficult to work with, but a number of these viruses are BSL-4 viruses. And so um, what people have turned to um, is uh, developing replicon systems. 
And the reason they've done this is because there's sort of, there's a lot to be learned about um, the actual replication in these viruses. Um, and there's, as uh, we just heard from the previous talk, um, because these uh, L proteins are so multi-enzymatic and multifunctional, it's been very challenging to understand the basic biology of them. And what we do know is that they have two kind of major modes of transcription. One is a discontinuous and polar transcription, and that involves generating uh, mRNA. Um, and when I say polar, um, what happens during transcription is that uh, the, 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 the virus, uh, the, the polymerase starts at the three prime end and transcribes and runs into a poly U tract for poly A adenylation. And then um, at some point skips and moves on to the next, uh, reinitiates transcription on the next gene and so forth down the line. And what happens is that at, during these reinitiations, at some frequency, the viral polymerase falls off the viral mRNA. And so what you end up getting is a, a, a higher amounts of transcription at the three prime end and lower amounts at the five prime end. Now at some point the, throughout the viral life cycle, the transcription mode shifts into a more processive mode where it actually replicates the entire uh, length of, of the viral RNA to make an anti-genomic anti RNA that um, is completely processive. And our understanding of the switch between these two modes of transcription is very um, limited. And so in vivo and in vitro assays that can help us to understand this will help us to understand these viruses better and maybe develop better targets for um, antiviral inhibition. So um, these replicant cysts that I mentioned that people develop are actually pretty complex. So um, this is an example for the Ebola virus. So here, um, what you need to do, as I mentioned, you need to have an RMP, not just a cDNA or something. So what people typically do is they have your favorite cell line, and they transfect in T7 RNA polymerase under the control of a host promoter. And then the four key here in Ebola virus, uh, there's four key proteins that are required for replication, NP, L polymerase, and then VP30 and VP35. These are both accessory factors that correspond to, effectively, the P. Um, and then you also need to provide a viral template. So this is uh, driven by the T7 promoter. So what happens is you transfect all four of these, all six of these plasmids into a cell. The T7, promote, the T7 polymerase is expressed. It recognizes the T7 promoter and generates a, a negative sense RNA template. And typically what we have is a mini genome here where there are sequences on the five prime and three prime end that are necessary and sufficient for the viral polymerase to be, re recognize that and replicate it. So you have this negative sense RNA, no signal, because it's in the negative sense orientation. The viral polymerase components are all um, expressed from the host. They recognize this template, code it, and uh, carry out transcription as well as replication. And you need rounds of replication in order for this transcription to create a signal that amplifies over the course of the viral life cycle. And you can read out the activity by, in this case, nanoluciferase signal. Um, so, um, this is a great system, you can boot it up pretty easily, but the cons are that it's inefficient, it's a transient system, and it's highly variable. And so um, 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 in prior studies that I've done at Novartis, one of the things that we looked at was ways that we could uh, simplify this system. So we've done experiments where we uh, combine the transcripts onto, um, multi let, you know, decrease the number of plasmids, it's still transient, but it works. And instead of uh, including T7 in the system, we just use in vitro transcribed RNA. And these systems were definitely active, but in certain cases where we wanted to do really high throughput screening and 1536 wall format, the variability was still problematic. So then we went on to um, developing clonal stable cell lines. Since we knew these systems worked transiently, we adapted the same systems to a cell, stable cell line. And we basically did sequential uh, uh, single cell cloning to generate a line where both the, um, the, um, the polymerase and these accessory proteins were present, and again, just transfect in the viral RNA. And this was active, but it took several months for us to generate. And as one of the key factors that we're trying to be able to boot up at the BioHub is rapid response, one thing I'm really interested in doing is exploring whether or not we can apply genome engineering approaches to speed this type of uh, replicon system up. And so that's going to be a, a key project that I'll be working on. Um, another aspect of the biology that I'm really, we're really interested in looking at at this sort of genomics-based approach is target-based approaches. So in the Montenegro virales, there's been, within about the past year, year and a half, there's been a number of, of structural and biophysical advances that have 
helped us to understand the N nuclear protein that um, is common to all these viruses. And while their sequences are very different, it actually seems that they form very similar three-dimensional structures, and these are just four of them that have been identified uh, or have been uh, uh, shown most recently. And there's an emerging theme that the um, nuclear protein and the P protein uh, interact together uh, in a way that regulates the function of the N protein in terms of its uh, monomeric state or it's, it's, it's an oligomeric state. So what's been found is the P protein, the N-terminal region, actually binds to a region of the nuclear protein that, when it's initially formed, uh, keeps it in a monomeric state. And uh, it, when that can be displaced by that monomeric state, I'm sorry, um, actually blocks the interaction of an, a given N-monomer with another N-monomer that's required for oligomerization, as well as RNA binding. And so the idea is that the P protein is functioning sort of as a chaperone to keep the N protein from uh, binding RNA until it's in the vicinity of viral RNA and um, it's binding RNA in the right place at the right time. And so what, uh, what I'm showing here on this side is a, a diagram of the mononegra viralis phy phylogeny. And in red are all the um, members of that phylogeny so far, where there's actually a co-crystal between that inhibitory peptide fragment of the P protein and the monomeric N protein. And those that have a, a, a sort of dark uh, blue square around them are those for which there's only um, biochemical data, but data that's consistent with this model. And so what, what we're really interested in doing is looking at this more broadly across all these different um, proteins, all these different members of the family, and, wonder, and trying to assess if this might be a tractable platform to target across all the viruses, developing some biochemical assays, not only to understand this interaction and how it regulates um, um, RNA binding and oligomerization, but also whether we, it might be a useful target for us to look at for um, potential antiviral drug development. We do know if, these, if you have mutations in the N protein that disrupt this interaction and vice versa, that influences the biological activity of the virus or RMP system. So it's going to be a really interesting and exciting pathway. So that's just one of, those are sort of two sort of vignettes of some actually pretty ambitious projects that I'll be working on initially. Um, and um, that's where we'll be going. And in terms of the last piece of uh, what we're doing, um, oh, sorry. Um, so what we'll be doing is booting, trying to boot up these systems for rapid and parallel analyses with the idea of uh, addressing not only sort of um, this drug, antiviral drug development aspect, but the basic biology or biochemical, biophysical aspects of these interactions and these functions. I'm also really interested to collaborate with the Cell Atlas colleagues at the Biohub to look at the cell biology. Uh, we, we have some ideas about a number of different, um, within, the, within the mononegra virales, they all seem to form, they for the most part replicate in the cytoplasm and form punctate replication complexes, but uh, it will be really interesting to do comparative and contrasting analyses of these in, in the cell visually, and uh, uh, we're gearing up to do some of those studies to understand how they, are, how they arise and how they localize. Uh, and likewise, there will be a number of, of projects going on related to developing CRISPR libraries at the Biohub. And um, what I am quite interested in doing is looking at host factor requirements for the viral transcription and replication within these uh, replicon systems. And as I mentioned, we'll be quite interested in doing uh, or partnering with external partners on systematic screens for chemical compounds that might influence these interactions that we're seeing, and then also my dream is that we'll be able to, given any sequence that's available for a new emerging pathogen, boot up a viral system in a rapid manner to be able to study those viruses. So we're starting with the mononegra virales, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to extend these approach, approaches or some variation of these approaches to other viral families. Um, and so if you have a favorite viral family um, that you are, are pretty interested in looking at for something like this, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about that.
Now, in terms of the last uh, fourth arm of what we're trying to do uh, in the Biohub, um, we also have this rapid response component to the work that we're uh, looking at. And we just, uh, Christine Tato is the associate director for that arm of our work, and she just started this week. So I was, uh, I'm really happy that she was able, she's also here um, and is able to talk to people afterwards. Um, and what we're looking to do there is partner with local and global public health organizations to understand where the basic science work that we're doing and the high throughput te technologies that we're building and developing could contribute to surveillance, outbreak analysis, and um, we're also looking uh, for collaborators with access to our expert, that need our access, expertise for in-country types of activities. And uh, she's going to be working uh, with others to help with rapid technology development and analyses. We're interested in developing tools and reagents that people can use either in collaboration with us or ultimately at some point be able to take out there in the field uh, that are related to pathogen characterization as well as host response. And then we're also very interested in, in uh, developing therapeutics and vaccines. There's a, a lot of work in the Biohub that we'll be doing related to antibodies as well as novel approaches to vaccine development. Um, so that's it. Um, I wanna just say thank you for everybody for your time and staying this late to hear uh, my talk um, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, that was very interesting. Um, has, there any, has there been any like milestones set for the uh, Biohub? So within five years, we wanna have two antibody therapies developed, or I mean, is, is there like milestones that have been set? Um, I don't think we're, we're not having milestones like that. Um, right now, it's very early stages of, of things. We will be evaluated, we do know we'll be evaluated at, at year seven or eight. Um, oh, the, okay. um, so what, um, what we know is that um, Mark and Priscilla typically do a really deep dive. They're viewing on, on like these types of experiments that they fund. So they're viewing the Biohub as kind of an experiment about how to nucleate these types of um, interactions and new collaborations maybe that haven't kind of been done before, sort of like mm -hmm. what I mentioned with the master uh, collaboration agreement. Mm -hmm. um, specific concrete goals like that are, are, are not yet something that I've heard about that would be on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think part of it is to do really new and innovative things, uh, do science in a different way, um, but we are, starting to develop our goals. We are just starting, it's like, you know, six months in, so we're starting to have meetings about our goal setting on that. Mm -hmm. so. so is there anyone in the Biohub that's gonna be focused on trying to translate all these uh, kind of basic research that you're, that you're performing, translate it into like a product or uh, a diagnostic test? So we're very much um, more at the early stage, academic stage. I think we will be interested in looking at, I mean, we'll certainly be interested if there are things that we can translate. That is a goal um, because as our mission is to, you know, cure or manage all diseases in our children's lifetime. Um, but the mechanisms of how we're going to do that and how much we're gonna be involved, we will not be doing clinical work. There's, that will not be part of our, our remit. Um, but whether something spins off that's, from our work that's clinical, um, I, you know, that could be an option, so. So you might like develop it in partnership with another, a pharmaceutical company? Yeah, yeah, we would be looking at those kinds of opportunities, yeah. 